from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Montgomery. I'm a reporter at the Washington Post where I work for the Sunday Magazine in the style section. Uh, the Post is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest for this program, Santiago Roncagliolo, uh, is one of the most daring, exciting, and inventive voices to emerge in Latin America, Latin American literature in the last decade. He was born in Peru in 1975. Soon after, his father was forced to move the family to Mexico for political reasons. The family returned to Lima in the 1980s, a time of strife and violence that would later be refracted in Santiago's fiction. He currently lives in Barcelona. Santiago's professional writing career began shortly after university, and it is about as diverse as one could imagine. He has written soap operas, prize-winning children's books. He has translated, if I'm not mistaken, Andre Gide and Joyce Carol Oates into Spanish. He has written biographies and journalism, and of course, novels and short stories. He was the youngest writer to win the Alfaguara Prize for Red April, which is a thriller mystery with a political context that we'll, hopefully we'll be talking about. <clears throat> Granta named him one of the best young Spanish language novelists. Um, besides Red April, unfortunately, I think for English readers, only one other work is available in English. We hope that'll change. Uh, and that's a short story collection called Hi, This is Conchita, which is funny, sexy, satirical, and a tiny bit creepy all at once. <laughs> I <clears throat> highly recommend it. I like, I like that definition. <laughs> I am all that. <laughs> um, and we'll talk, well, great, let's get into that. His other works, uh, I'll give you the Spanish titles, Crecer es un oficio triste, Pudor, Tan Cerca de la Vida, and La Pena Maxima, which will bring back the protagonist of Red April. I, I want to hear about that, too. Um, Daniel Alarcón, another Lima-based, Lima-born novelist who's also here at, at the book festival, has said that Santiago, quote, is one of Latin America's most important young voices. He is rigorous, fearless, and funny, with a keen eye for absurdity embedded within the everyday. A new book by Roncagliolo is a cause for celebration. End quote. Please welcome Santiago Roncaliolo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the program that's been set up is I, I am to ask some questions of sort of interview Santiago for hopefully no more than, than 20 minutes. And then I really want the most important thing is to, to get a good dialogue going with, with you all. And we'll probably get bored talking to each other. So, And I hope Santiago will take um, his answers in any direction he wants. And I'll just. Um, try and stay out of the way of all the good conversation. Um, I just wanted to start with that one biographical fact of your uh, amazing diversity of the kinds of writing you've done. Um, how is it possible for you to switch between so many channels? And, and is crossing genres something helpful to your writing? Is it invigorating um, to you? Well, uh, in fact, I basically always write about one main subject, which is fear, one way or the other one. Uh -huh. Sometimes very close to thriller, political thriller, psychological thriller, black humor. Yeah. Then when it's comedy, it's about uh, fear, creepy things. <laughs> and, uh, but um, at the same time that I have a very um, um, concentrated main subject, I, I always want to explore and to use, to make a, a new Travels. That's what, what what you do when when you write a book. You you want to make a, a new travel. Like when you go to a country, you, you don't go always to holidays to the same place. You want to explore new ways, new new new, new stories, new uh, stages. And uh, many of my stories usually come out from my own life, from the things I, I've lived. And um, I've lived in in Mexico, in Peru, in, in Spain, in Madrid, and in Barcelona, and, and I travel a lot. Many of the things I, uh, I write come from uh, also traveling, so I, I usually think, what is the story we could talk, tell here? What story could be, uh, in, could happen in Miami, where it happens one of my books, or in, or in Argentina, or, or mainly in Peru, or, or in Spain. So. I, I contact a lot the, the experience of writing with the experience of traveling, and I always want to, to meet a new place. Is it, I don't know if it's possible, but I, I wanted to ask, is there a, a concrete example from 
one work or one story? Can you remember the everyday experience that you saw in a place and then realized, ha, this, this could possibly, I could work this into a story or inspire a story? Well, is, you know, Red April, for yeah. talking about this one, which is translated, um, I was, um, uh, it's based in Ayacucho, where, where it was the center of all the political violence of the, of the 80s in Peru. Yeah. And, uh, and I worked there later, and it was all this story of war, this is a story of death, of, of very violent uh, um, experiences of the country. And, and I went there uh, during the Holy Week. I don't know if you know what is the Holy Week, because you are not Catholics, don't you? I, I'm married to a Catholic. So okay. I okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I know in Ayacucho, it's Holy Week is huge. It's Amazing. A, yeah, it's like in Spanish, Sevilla. With that, it's, it's the most traditional in the world. And, uh, but it's basically a, um, a celebration of death. I mean, it's each day, uh, Christ is tortured, and then he dies, and then we wait, and, and then he comes back and on Sunday again. There's one day where, where the Virgin, an image of the Virgin is passed all around the city with seven knives crossing the, 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 the heart. Uh, there's another day when uh, the image of a naked Christ with blood all around his body into a crystal box. It's um, taken all the city around and uh, they turn out the lights. It's, it's everything dark and it's just candles. And it's like a, this naked, dead, bloody Christ wow. moving into the dark, surrounded by candles. And so you see this and you say, a thriller, a thriller. This is the <laughs> perfect <laughs> place for a thriller. And, um, and at the same time, it's a story who, who wanted to talk about the moment of the history of my country when, when everybody became kind of a serial killer. Both sides were very violent, and you couldn't keep out from this. Everybody was supporting one on the other side, so uh, everybody was responsible of what was happening, even if you didn't actually pull the trigger. And uh, more or less this way, uh, uh, stories happen, and I take things from reality, but uh, reality is uh, terribly written. God is a bad <laughs> scream writer. So I, dial, you have dialogues that never end and stories which uh, shouldn't cross and they don't and so you, you correct these mistakes. <laughs> That's a great way to describe it. <laughs> when did you, do you recall the time when you were young and thinking about becoming a writer, correcting some of God's mistakes? Do you recall when that career, that life seemed possible for you and what? Being a writer? Yeah. When I begin yeah. to think? Well, probably when we came back um, from Mexico. I, I grew up in Mexico. Uh, and uh, we went, we came back in the middle of the 80s during all this process of violence. And uh, there were bombs outside and um, uh, kidnappings and curfews and blackouts. Uh, very often, almost all weeks. And, uh, and you couldn't go out from home, usually. Um, so you stayed home uh, reading. That's what we had there. <laughs> Lots of books. Uh, um, um, and I always I had this experience coming from Mexico that there was a different world, a better world anywhere else. Uh, because when you are a child, you, you don't imagine there you just accept life as it is. But when coming from abroad, you have the feeling that there's a different world. This, uh, there's a better world than this. And, uh, and since I couldn't come back to that life, I could read. I could read about other worlds and, 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 uh, and other places, and be in other places, having different lives with different characters. And uh, I begin to, um, to be a, a reader this, these years when I was um, when I was a child. And then, uh, you know, at the beginning of the 90s, I studied literature. I loved reading always. But uh, um, if you were a Peruvian 
in the beginning of the 90s, uh, you had the idea that for being a writer, you should make uh, books of 700 pages and <laughs> be candidate to president. So it didn't look like very easy thing to get. Uh, it, it, yeah. it, it, it was like unacceptable, but uh, um, unaccessible. Un Inaccessible. Unattainable. Yes? Something yes. like yep. that. Yep. Very difficult to, to arrive there. But I, uh, um, I always knew I, I, I loved to, to write. I was a journalist. I was a soap opera writer, as you said. I, I, I wrote uh, political speeches, which is a very interesting form of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and that, um, I always knew I was going to write. I never thought I would be a professional writer, actually. That, that, that was a surprise later. Uh, but I knew. It would be about writing. I was not going to be a physician. Um, it's a shame for my <laughs> parents, especially. Um, but I begin to work around uh, writing, and, and uh, well, I, I, I became a, a professional writer in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, some, sometimes a, a, a Latin American novelist, outsiders think that there, a lot of the subject matter is the. Uh, p political troubles of the recent past. I would never pigeonhole you that way. Your work is incredibly diverse. But just to stay on that theme for one more minute with um, Red April, you're in a generation, uh, I think you can find contemporaries in, in Colombia and other Peruvian writers, and I think in Spain, of, of, of people who grew up, who were, who were too young to have been actors in, in, in the recent terrible times, yeah. but are now using their art in, a, in imaginative and very different ways to I don't know what's the right word to make sense of it, to um, remember it, to lay it to rest, um, to bring it to account. Is that a, a responsibility? That's a heavy word. But is that something that, that a, a writer of your generation feels a, a, a duty to do? Or is it it's part of your fabric? You have no choice, maybe. I don't. Well, I, um, I had to think about this stuff, especially with a nonfiction book called The Fourth Sword, La Cuarta Espada, which was a uh, about the leader of the Shining Path, uh, Guzman, Arimael Guzman, which was a long investigation, and, and um, but f for me, I, I just tell the story, and uh, for me, it was also my story. Ah. I grew up. This is my war. I was there. Yeah. This is. The, I want to know why I couldn't get out from home, why we were living with fear, why. Um, uh, we were we uh, we had no light by night and and and, and uh, we could meet a corpse in the street and why? Uh, if you are an academicist, you, you work in the university. You usually make essays of interpretation. Uh, but I'm a journalist, so the only thing I could go is go there and ask why. Yes. Go to the jail and say, okay, why this happened? Um, and. Um, it was important, it was therapeutical for me writing this uh, story. And for many people in my generation, because I, I saw the same in Spain, where, where I live now. After the violence, nobody wants to talk. Yeah. It's not even the winners. It's like <laughs> creepy, everything about what happened. Uh, um, it's painful for people who was there. But, but the people who were, who were uh, children, in that time, uh, is not suspicious. Uh, if I say um, that terrorism was possible because of inequality, everybody understands that, yes, it's a fact, it's simply obvious. But if uh, uh, a guy of uh, 60, 70 years old now says this, he's justifying terrorism. Right. If I say that the army um, committed lots of excesses because they had no uh, political uh, direction, and, and we should, the civil political party should have take control, taken control of, of them. It's obvious, yes, it's a fact. But if you say this, and you are 60s or 70s, you are a fascist, and if you were there, you are suspicious, and it's very, com it's not about the facts, but who you are. But if you, you were a child, uh, it's a, People trust you more, and your eyes are cleaner. And uh, many people in my generation have been making a 
a remarkable work in Peru to um, retake, retell the story from their personal lives. Children of, um, uh, of the military repressors and children of the terrorists also have written books, uh, which are the books that, uh, and I guess it's a process that is remarkable, is not easy in many countries. They do not this. They want to stay hating each other. Yeah. And uh, Peru is making a little of therapy with the books of the people of my generation. And, and I'm very proud to have a little part of, this, uh, of these uh, stories, to, to have written uh, um, about it. Uh, and I keep coming back. To, to the subjects. Um, I keep coming back to politics um, uh, as a subject. But the problem is that we have this tradition of political writers. Uh, we usually know more writers as a politicians than as writers. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, yeah. when you are too much talking about this stuff, everybody begins to treat you like a politician. <laughs> You sit here, and they do not never ask you for the books, but they begin to say, "Well, when financial crisis is going to end?" <laughs> <laughs> you say, "I don't know. I, I write fiction. I just, <laughs> I, I, you are mistaken, and um, and you have uh, the risk to uh, to be more known, well known as a guy who comments and opinionates about yes. almost everything." than as a writer of stories. And, I, and so I, I try to, be, to make an equilibrium among both things. Um, just a couple more before we open it up. Um, when, I think when some readers think of the Peruvian novel or the Peruvian novelist, they will inevitably think of Mario Vargas Llosa. And there are some people who maybe that's the, the only Peruvian novelist they can name for it. For you and for maybe your contemporaries writing uh, 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 writing fiction, is that a, a burden? The, the shadow of that is, is is Vargas Llosa someone to write in reaction to? Is it is it um, uh, or someone to, to to try and ignore because you can't have your own art if there's such a, um, a, a voice? What, well, what's your re um, artistic relationship with that monument? Mainly with the translations. It's funny because uh, what publishers want and critics want, and everybody wants from you is uh, to, put, to be able to put you the label, the new Mario Vargas, <laughs> they love. You know, when you write about in politics, they say, okay, the new Mario Vargas, and they have always any, any they, they, they have, uh, we have been like four or five new Mario Vargas. So in the end, we never are, actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's also remarkable of him as a writer, how he has designed a country, how people understand this country and what they know about this country is because of the things this guy wrote in books. Yeah. And uh, that's fascinating. And, and so at the same time, uh, when people uh, say that of your job, uh, you shouldn't be angry. You should be proud yeah. that uh, you are uh, somehow compared or related to, a, to such a such a big figure, and uh, and of course, uh, well, it's the same thing with my biological father. I, I, I've been all of my life trying not to be like him, but I have his nose. You know? <laughs> and uh, with Vargas Llosa, it's the same. It, it's part of your DNA. When, when he when he writes about violence, uh, when I write about violence, I have lots of references on his uh, yeah. on his work when. Uh, he has, in fact, uh, a couple of amazing political thrillers, which are La Fiesta del Chivo and um, Ritumen Los Andes. And uh, uh, it's a master of political thriller. Uh, but I also remember many Latin American writers of, of somehow horror and fear. Uh, when I was um, a child, I would read uh, Cortazar, Julio Cortazar's stories like La Noche Boca Arriba, which is a little horror story uh, with yeah. a, an amazing ending, unexpected, and, or Casa Tomada, which is a, a sh very short psychological thriller when a presence, you don't know exactly what, yeah. is taking the rooms of the house. Uh -huh. And the narrator is still in there, coming, they are there, 
but you never know what they are, and, 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 and he's getting close and close into a little room while this presence takes all the space around. Uh, or Rulfo uh, with these dead people living. Yeah. Uh, Rulfo books are about Pedro ghosts. Param Pedro, Pedro Paramo and Llano en Llamas are about ghosts of dead people who talks and comes to assault the living. Yeah. Um, or um, Carlos Fuentes Aura is a terrible horror story, wonderful, with a, with a haunted house. And uh, it's told in second person. The, the character is you. Oh, wow. So it's very scary. And, and, <laughs> and I, uh, I always love this, uh, maybe because of the fact that I was, um, I grew up with fear. Yeah. I uh, always loved these writers and this fiction. And also American old fiction, TV fiction like The Twilight Zone or these uh, things, because um, it was a fear you could control. And like the fear in real life, uh, this was like playing with the same thing. It was a, a fear uh, you could just, in case you had too much fear, just close the book or turn, out, turn off the TV. And, and I always hoped, I always hoped that uh, reality were that way also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we shouldn't leave out Conchita, the other collection. Hi, this is Conchita, which which is um, well, the, the the novella. The, the, it's a collection of stories, and and the title novella is, is all told through uh, telephone calls. It's very creatively structured, and the character Conchita happens to, uh, to fill in people who haven't read it. Happens to be. Uh, a, who works on a phone sex line, so she's re receiving phone calls. But there are other characters who have nothing to do with that. And there's even uh, Santiago manages to work in a murder and a hit and stuff. And I, that uh, must have been incredibly fun to write. And we're, yes. we're, we're, was that sort of a? Well, it, it was really. We were thinking. It was written um, in Madrid when I was just there, and I was uh, working with a, a theater. Company, little company. Yeah. But theater company sounds too big for what we were. <laughs> we were like off, 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 off Broadway. <laughs> A little group of people making uh, funny things, and uh, and um, uh, we wanted to 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 play uh, uh, to to make a, a a little piece about. Uh, People looking for love in the most unexpected places because the characters are uh, like looking for love desperately in the most unexpected places. They are uh, having these mm, retorted conversations, and uh, and I love the feeling that um, talking about by phone is something very intimate because you are near the ear of the other person, but yeah. you cannot touch it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's somehow a story of oral sex. They are, they are talking and talking, but they are doing nothing, really, because it's just in the words, in the dialogues okay. they have. And um, we have lots of fun also making that uh, a little uh, piece uh, of, of, of theater. But uh, it was written this way from the beginning. And, uh, and uh, when my American agent uh, saw that, say, this is this is very funny and very original. Why, why don't we publish it? And I say, OK, yeah, <laughs> so. And um, it has also, the book has also a, a, a few stories, yes. also about fear in, in more uh, mm. intimate domains. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful jewel-like stories. One set at Carnival in Barcelona, and um, one where a, a guy doesn't realize that he's just died in a taxi accident until he sits on a bus next to a woman who's been Shot yes. in the cities filled with dead people. It sounds and there's another which is uh, creepy but excellent. <laughs> unfortunately, um, a chronicle. The guy, the, the the story of the people suiciding. Yes, it's just uh, it's nonfiction. I'm afraid. Uh, Your friends. Yeah. Wow. I grew up in a place where seven people I knew suicided before we were 25 years old. Wow. Wow. And uh, I always. Uh, consider that was a, a signal of something horrible, but you can never know exactly what is uh, yeah. is there. And uh, I love this kind of mystery. I, I use that lots in, in when I write uh, living mysteries uh, for you to decide 
which is which one is the solution. Um, I hope you guys have lots of questions. But please, um, uh, let's let's go with that. Who who would like to start? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I said uh, thank you for all your work, and uh, it's uh, I'm really proud to be a Peruvian when you have such good work that you bring thank forward. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question was, uh, first off, besides Vargas Llosa, who are the other authors that really influence your work? And uh, second question in that, uh, can we expect more of Chacaltana? and future to come? OK. <laughs> well, many writers I love. I, I love many American writers, really. Uh, for the way I write, uh, I love Joyce Carol Oates or Chuck Palahniuk, uh, which are writers of monsters, somehow, of, of very, uh, somehow, horror stories, psychological or emotional horror stories, usually. And Chuck Palahniuk also has lots of black humor, which I really enjoy. Um, so many people think he has no sense of humor. <laughs> so probably I, I'm the only one who finds it funny. <laughs> and um, uh, the same in Spanish. I love the writers uh, about dark sides. Roberto Bolaño, for example, it's uh, it's amazing when. when when crossing political uh, facts, uh, pop culture, and uh, he can have in the same story Pinochet torturers and porno actresses, and that's, uh, that's, that's amazing the way he, he does it. Um, and about, um, well, many Japanese writers. Japanese can be f f fascinatingly cruel and elegance at the same time, Murakami or uh, Tanisaki or, or this atmosphere I love in, about Japanese literature. Uh, they are always telling just little details of things, but something horrible is going to happen any moment. And, uh, uh, and this suspense atmosphere they, they get, uh, I always love to read. Um, Chacaltana. Chacaltana was, um, when he was born, he was born older. He was born like 40 years old, more or less. Uh, this is the main character in Red April to fill yes. people in. And is the prosecutor Chacaltana, which is like, uh, these are two uh, noir novels I've written, and he's the main character, the one who makes the research. And uh, it's a very peculiar detective for crime novels because he's the only detective in literature who actually he doesn't want to investigate anything <laughs> he would prefer just to close the papers into a um, uh, into an archive and forget about it he he doesn't want to know but uh, but reality explodes in front of his face and he he's compelled to to uh, to um, discover the mainly the, the most uh, painful and dark so, um, uh, moments of Peruvian history in the last decades. And uh, he was born when I was myself working in human rights in Peru in the 90s. And uh, I was more or less the same. I have this naive uh, approach to things. I, I would believe, like him, that law is clear and law is easy. And then when you confront violence, you realize that it's not so easy, and there are many complicated uh, 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 facts in reality that uh, you never uh, get to understand in the end, and then they, they challenge your, your moral framework. Uh, and all the pathetic things that happened to him, m many of them happened to me, are, are his pathetically autobiographical, really, of about the, many of the things that of his problems were my problems also. And his question was, is he going to come back? And, and, and it depends on him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I, um, was, uh, I didn't want him back. 
after the first novel. The, the first novel has a very big success, like more than 20 translations and prizes in, in the UK and Spain. And too much success. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a, you risk to, to, to be as, as hostage of this character or, or, a, or, a, or a slave to him. And everybody loves him so much. He's a popular character in Peru. Uh, last time I came, I was in migration. And being an immigrant, I'm always, um, I feel a bit creepy always in airports and with migration, even if um, migration police, even if, if it's my migration police, <laughs> I'm not very comfortable. And uh, this guy received my passport, look here and there and say, mm, you must know Mr. Felix Chakaltana. <laughs> It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know him. Not Chakaltana, he really knows life, he says. <laughs> he stamped and I, I went, but he's very popular, so I, I didn't want to, I didn't want him to be more important than me. Yeah. And, uh, and I hated him for a while, and, um, and I was making very different, um, on purpose, very different things also, to get rid of him. And, uh, but I was, uh, in the, with the last novel, I, I, I had this story linked to the, about the links among Peruvian dictatorship and Argent Argentinian dictatorship and the reflect of European fascism in South America during the 70s and football and the, 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 the 78 World Cup in Argentina. I have all these fascinating things I wanted to write about and I didn't know how. And I spent many months trying to look for the way, try one way, try other way. And, and when I was uh, depressed and drunk in a bar, feeling that I was never going to write a novel again and uh, that it was all over, Chakaltan appeared to me and said, Mister, I could write your story. <laughs> I said, I don't want you to write my story. I hate you. <laughs> he said, but mister, actually, how old were you in the World Cup of 78? <laughs> I was three years old. So mister, who was there in 78? <laughs> <laughs> and so I accepted him. And it was like working. In fact, when he entered the novel, it was so easy. Yeah. It was uh, everything suddenly connected in perfect, the structure was so easy, and uh, it was like also like meeting an old friend. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed, again, working with uh, Chakaltana. Um, but if he comes back, it's up to him. I, I'm, I'm not sure he, 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 he's coming back, uh, always. Um, yes, sir. Uh, yes, I very much enjoyed your beginning comments. Um, uh, just a, a difference, I think, in the U.S., uh, uh, being a Catholic, uh, Holy Week was viewed not in terms of death, but in terms of the resurrection. And uh, in our politics, you know, a liberal such as President Obama runs on the theme of hope, not fear. And we have William Faulkner, when he t accepts the Nobel Prize for literature, he talks about not just surviving, but prevailing. So we, we live in a culture, in most, I think our dominant culture is hope. And uh, you, your th main, one of your main themes, and I can understand it, uh, given the, the, certainly the political turmoil and confusion in Peru is fear. Do you view us as naive, or do you believe that there is uh, some kind of uh, hope that we're just not uh, naive? Uh, I always think there is hope. I, uh, for being such a, a writer of such a nightmare things, I'm very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Probably because I went through, as many Peruvians, uh, we went through horrible things. And, uh, but we also then saw how things could get better. Probably not perfect, very far from perfect. but. Uh, if um, I believe, which is, I think, uh, a way of feeling very, I see in, very, in the North American culture lots, uh, that if we actually want and we are together, and things get better. Um, 
I also wanted. Um, I also love the. Um, the, 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 the um, Subject of death and uh, and pop uh, and ghosts and monster, monsters as, as metaphors of what happened in into societies. I mean, uh, zombies actually exist. You should listen to Donald Trump. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Use the follow -up Every question. idea he says <laughs> is a living dead. <laughs> he thinks that his ideas are alive, but they are all dead. Um, I love this, um, I mean, ghosts and monsters, they exist, but they are not supernatural. They are into the, into the history of the countries, into the mind of the people, into the hearts of the people. And, uh, and writing is always an optimistic act. It's, a, it's, a, it's an, uh, an act of faith on, 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 on that you can somehow defeat the monsters, put them under your control. Probably is naive, but I'm a I'm a writer. It's very naive being a writer. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Please. Th thank you very much for this uh, so interesting and enlightening talk. And while I was listening to you, I was um, wondering about the following thing, and I just thought, well, I'm going to ask him. You live in Barcelona, and I was wondering whether the process that Catalonia is going undergoing at this moment has any impact on your writing. I'm, I just want to make clear that I'm not asking you about what you think about the fact that an important part of the region or nation of Catalonia um, is seeking independence from Spain, and this is being led by the regional government. I'm, ask, I'm not asking about your ideas about this, but if that has any impact on your writing since you live there and you write from there and you write yeah. in Spanish. Well, in fact, uh, more and more since I've been 15 years in, in Spain, when I do write about, make opinions about politics, there are more about Spain than about Peru because it's the, the way, the, way, the world I live, where my children grow up, where, where I pay taxes, so <laughs> it's the place where uh, you. which, which <laughs> I, I, I'm part of this social and political reality. And, uh, uh, and I've written about the Catalonia things. Uh, and I'm not the most popular person in Catalonia right now. <laughs> <laughs> because I precisely think that uh, under, understanding their national and independent feelings, which are as all feelings respectable, breaking with Spain means also breaking with Spanish language, which also means breaking with Latin America in many ways, cultural ways. Uh, also means breaking up with me, with my story, with the language I write in. Um, I speak Catalan. I, I love to be part of uh, Catalonia. I, I admire that this society lo lots. But I always thought that uh, and admire the fact that they could have two languages and two identities and not finding any conflict among them. And uh, I don't want to have to choose one or the other one. And uh, in fact, it was a very good, a good chance to stay in silence <laughs> that uh, when you really think something, you must tell. It, it, what, what, what would be a, tr a, a, a betrayal would be stay in silence, not to have problems, and not uh, to see to say what you actually think. Um, I hope there is a, a solution for Catalonia that uh, does not imply to resign one culture. More, as this country shows perfectly well, more than one culture is a richness. You shouldn't reject that. You shouldn't uh, get rid of that. Yeah. Can I just? Yeah. Uh, Can I just very quick, because we're. Low okay. on time, and there's one more per. Okay, yeah, why, why don't we? Thank you. Okay. We're, we have less than. Yes, please. Oh, hi. I am wondering if you think that death is the primarily thing that inspires Latin American to write, or maybe this, there is a biggest fear like losing <coughs> liberty that inspires new Latin American writers? Oh, uh, well, if you ask me, usually when, when people go to prison, they rather go to prison than go to death. Uh, I guess our primarily fear is, is dying. And, 
And violence is a very um, extended thing in the whole America, also here. Uh, America is very violent all around it. And, uh, and for many people, um, the main risk in their daily lives in many countries of uh, our continent is just go in the street and die. Um, so still, I guess, uh, we, we, we have uh, 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 an important culture of dying and uh, an important uh, uh, writing about, about death. Uh, also freedom, but, uh, but well, you, you may be in prison, but you're still alive, you know? It's, it's uh, like a, death is a more primal, primal fear, I guess. Okay. Thanks. I think we have time for one more. Yep. Yes, please. Hello. Um, thank you for being here. I'm Peruvian, and anytime I have a chance to write in, to read about Peruvian writers, I'm like in front of the line. Anyway, thank so you. I wanted to know what um, this great book, um, El Amante Uruguayo. Can you tell us why you chose to write about Garcia? Um, Lorca, yes, it's a very funny story. Yes, <laughs> and <laughs> how long did it take you? Because you must have just flown back and forth between, you know, Uruguay, Argentina, yeah. and Barcelona, and yeah. Well, that book is not a novel, really. When the, all these things I've been saying, uh, it's about my fiction. This thing about uh, fears and dead and, and, and these obsessions uh, have to do with my fiction. But I also have a trilogy of uh, non-fiction books on Latin American history of the 20th century. Uh, one, I said a bit about this, uh, Abimael Guzman, the, the fourth word, and uh, the other one is about uh, the mafia in El Caribe in the 50s, and, and this is the third one. Um, those are stories, real stories, written like novels, but stories. And uh, in this case, I was, um, I was hired to look for the corpse of Garcia Lorca, uh, a Andalusian publisher called me and said, uh, we know where's the corpse of Federico Garcia Lorca, you want to write the book? And I said, oh. I said, these, these people is crazy, then the next one is going to say, will come to me to say, I saw Elvis buying bread in Africa, <laughs> I want to make the book. But I said, let's show what you have. And, um, and in fact, they have many indicios, uh, suggestions, not exactly proofs, but uh, uh, there was a strange ceremony of burial of bur in Uruguay with many suggestions of, uh, of, of that, that, that the, the bones of Garcia Lorca were being buried there. And, uh, and it was fascinating, and I was um, fascinated with this story, but when I begin to make um, the, the research, I realized that the, the guy who has done that has also plenty of false uh, suggestions and he was a master of marketing and he would know, he was a poet, not a good poet, <laughs> but uh, perfect for um, getting into the life of the famous people. He was lover of Garcia Lorca, he was, uh, he, uh, he made sabotage to the career of Pablo Neruda while he pretended being his friend. He uh, disguised as Jean-Paul Sartre to keep into a meeting between Picasso and Chaplin. And <laughs> he's like the, he saw the story of the 20th century and he's uh, the guy in the corner of the picture. You know? He's always in the corner of the picture. And, but he saw it all and he was always in the important moments and he was a master of of imposture and, and, um, or, and, and lies, but uh, at the same time, that was his great novel. That was because he's, uh, the research took two years. It was not so long because he left all the archives with all his personal correspondence, uh, even the receipts of uh, uh, um, royalties uh, from books, bad reviews, good reviews, everything, everything. So uh, it, there was a big work to, to contrast all this information and to, to show all the lies he was telling. But uh, uh, for me, it's a fascinating story because it's the real story of a liar. So you never 
<coughs> in the end, I get to know what he says, what he thinks, and what is the true one. Among the three, there can be many differences. Santiago, thank you so much for... Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.